I'm back for another presentation. Uh, this time we will have a little bit more technical one than sales one. So uh, usually when I design my presentations, I design them for one big purpose. So the last one written over there. So to reduce the amount of uh, emails to the support, it's very simple, it's very selfish, I'm not hiding it. <laughs> uh, but basically all the inspiration for these presentations come from the emails that we see to the support. And the trends are very similar, it doesn't matter if you're in New Zealand, in Australia, or in Europe, or in USA, the guys are running into the same type of problems. So, objectives for this presentation, so uh, first of all, to help you understand and combine fast pass and slow pass features, uh, to allow your MicroTik equipment to do more, and then to encourage you to use uh, latest RotorOS versions and latest uh, RotorOS features. So th the plan is uh, very simple. Uh, we'll have we will talk about how to make uh, how to not make mistakes in hardware choices, the hardware usage in layer two and layer three feature usage. So uh, basically uh, we'll try to show them, I will try to explain the mistakes and then we'll try to cover the information what's necessary to avoid those mistakes. So uh, basically uh, choosing the right hardware for the job is by far the most common mistake uh, from the customers. We see everything starting from guys using uh, simple small boxes as 750 basically to run the BGP network. Uh, so and the ending up with uh, buying CCR 72 cores for home solution. So just two extremes but that's that's what we get every day. So uh, Basically, each MicroTik device is very specific, in both in structure, so by structure I mean number of CPU cores, amount of memory, and port interconnection, and then there's performance, switching performance, bridging performance, routing performance, and also latest trend, now that uh, all the regular VPNs are easily hackable, it's IPsec encryption performance. So, and in order for me to help you uh, to explain in some uh, flowing manner all these problems. I will have help from a few guys. So meet the first guy, Dave. <laughs> so uh, he's a smart, experienced network administrator. He's uh, well certified in all the mainstream routers, which not be named here. Uh, but you can take a look at, at his shirt and you will understand. Um, so as usual, there was a disaster, main rotor died, so, and Dave needs to get ev at least some of the services going right now, at this instant moment, and of course, the only spare equipment that he can find on his hand is a HEX, Home Ethernet Exchange Device, 750GR3, uh, from some company called Microtik, uh, that some friend gave him to try this out, this is really good. So, and Dave needs some MPLS, L2TP plus IPsec, firewall and routing. So he gives the device a try. So a few days later, uh, again, mind its shirt. It's a wrong MicroTik emblem there, but at least it's in the right direction. So he managed to fix uh, all the services that he needed with this 750 GR3. He's in shock. That 60, de 60 de US dollar de device can actually do all those things. He discovers uh, Rotorus and becoming a fan. And of course, at that, that point, he starts sending a lots of questions to the MicroTik support. So, and I don't mean like one per week or, or two per week, uh, that's like 10, 20 emails per week. So, of course, Dave runs into the problem. So, let's start with the first problem. So, he has a daily database exchange. And for some reason, this uh, exchange is limited not to one gigabit full duplex, 
but to one gigabit half duplex. And the CPU is hitting 100%. He's using uh, routing uh, with large packets. And he doesn't know how to diagnose that. So to actually to see why the he has such a problem, he needs to take a look at the block diagram of this device. Have any one of you actually go went into Microtik page and looked at the block diagram? Please raise your hand if you did. Okay, it's a it's a percentage wise it's much more better than in Europe. <laughs> so and the reason is uh, Dave is using Ethernet port 2 and Ethernet port 4. And if we take a look at the block diagram, you will see that uh, odd and even ports use separate lines to the CPU. So if you use port 1, 5, and 1, 3, and 5, it actually shares the same 1 gigabit line to CPU, and port 2 and 4 shares another line. So if you put most of the traffic on the same line, it will share that one gigabit full duplex. So you will not be able to get it. Only one gigabit half duplex will be available to you. <laughs> Just plug the wire into the right port and you get the full duplex instantly without any issues. So simply knowing that these diagrams exist and how your device is structurized and how they behave, you can eliminate a bottleneck just by plugging the wire into the right port. So just to state that. OK, so time goes by. The next problem that Dave have. So uh, he reads about new uh, hardware bridge or the switch option of the new this device. So he switches two of the ports for his needs. And suddenly, again, his connection that he fixed is back to this one gigabit half duplex. Um, to actually see the reason, he needs to look at the other diagram of 750GR3. Uh, and the reason is very simple. As soon as you put some of the ports in the switch, uh, the switch will get one dedicated line, and the other ports will, get, uh, will be left with other gigabit line. So as soon as you create a hardware switch, it will get a dedicated gigabit line to the CPU, and all the other ports will share other gigabit line to the CPU. So that's how 750GR3 specifically behaves when you create a hardware switch. So actually to improve uh, on this situation, in his particular case, he doesn't need to use a switching. Uh, he needs to use simple bridging. Then the hardware switch is not created, and st he still have two separate gigabit lines. So that's just to indicate that it's very important to see how the hardware behaves from the block diagram point of view so that you can plan your setup properly. So uh, basically what happens, you cannot uh, like leave 750 as the only solution in your data center that solves the day. So you need to op improve upon it. So he, Dave actually looks for more ports, and he decides that he wants to replace his 750 with 3011. So he needs more switching throughput. So now he knows what the diagram is, so he examines the diagram. And of course, at this point, he is getting even more enthusiastic about Microtik, so he starts to write even more emails to the support. Um, so if we take a look at the 3011 diagram, you will see that uh, each switch port have two gigabit lines to the, to the CPU. But as soon as you plug in SFP port, a second switch from port to 6 to 10 will lose one of the gigabit lines to the SFP. So it will just have one. So, but um, after the switch, uh, he finds out that uh, there's some problems. And his problem, number three, is that L2TP plus IPsec connections are overloading his router. CPU is running 100%, throughput is down, and he's in shock because 3011 should be more powerful. So, 
other thing that we have on every page of every product is performance tables. So if we take a look at the performance table of the 3011, yes, the raw performance, so this is 750G, this is 3011, you will see that uh, numbers for 3011 is, yes, two times or even three times more powerful than uh, 750, but there's such thing as hardware IPsec acceleration. 750 unit have it, and 3011 doesn't. So as soon as you enable hardware encryption, 750 can offload it to, his, to this hardware acceleration unit, encryption unit, but uh, 3011 can't do that. So that's why it's, very s it's slower uh, than 750 was when you use L2TP uh, with the IPsec acceleration. So the second thing I want to emphasize here is not only you need to check block diagram, but you also need to check performance tables and feature sets the device is coming with. So currently, the trend is that newer devices will have this IPsec acceleration stuff, because uh, that's the only proper way to keep your data safe when you're using VPN. As we know, PPTP is like 30 second question to hack into. So it's not secure anymore. Okay, so uh, basically with the, this new information, now Dave examines performance table of IPsec hardware encryption and decides to replace his 750 GR3 with the 1100, the old one, AHX2. He also examines block diagram for switching bottlenecks and decides to put most demanding throughput on ports 11, 12, and 13. So let's, if we take a look at the performance table, uh, we can see that uh, 1100 AX2 is like three times to four times faster. Uh, and if we take a look at the hardware encryption, yeah, 2.5 to three times more hardware encryption speed uh, than a 750. But, uh, of course, they've run into another problem. Uh, so, his 1100 AX AHX2 doesn't perform as expected. So, performance not better, but even worse, uh, especially on ports 12 and 13. So, if we take a look at the diagram, you will see that ports uh, 12 and 13 are connected through the PCI line. They are not connected directly to the CPU like port uh, 11. So this is actually management port and this is emergency bypass port. So when the power goes off, they, this will work as a bypass from port 11. But uh, when you have some ports connected through the PCI express line, they are are quite a bit slower and more expe expensive to maintain than the ports that are connected directly to the CPU. So to actually, to, w to, m to use this 11AHX2 properly, you need to flow your traffic like these. So from one switch chip to another or to port 11. So this will produce the most efficient way for traffic and highest throughput possible on that particular device. So, yet again, another example, uh, it's uh, how it's important is to examine block diagram and use the device properly. So, the time flies by. Finally, he finds the perfect equipment for his uh, solution. So, he purchases 1100AH-X4 uh, so, uh, he starts to invest investigate other places where he can put Microtech equipment. And, of course, he continues to write to Microtech support at Microtech.com. And we probably already created a separate folder for him at support. <laughs> and uh, try to keep a limited number of answers uh, to that guy so that he's not getting over enthusiastic at this point. So if we take a look at this X4, so 
it has very big improvements in uh, speed to the each switch chip. So there's three switch chips. Each of them have 2.5 gig line to the CPU. So not one gigabit line as the previous models, but 2.5. And all the ports are equal in this case, all go through the switch chip directly to the CPU. So it doesn't really matter what you use. So, but if you want to bridge or switch something, it's better to keep yourself inside the one switch group and so on. If we take a look at the performance, we will see that X4 is even two times faster on average than uh, X2. And if we take a look at IP security, uh, hardware encryption, it's even two to three times more faster than X2 even in with the hardware encryption. So this solution, this hardware solution should probably keep Dave busy for some time. So that was from hardware point of view. I hope I got my point across that it's very, very important to examine all the hardware statistics that we put on our page to actually so that you can choose the proper hardware for your usage. Okay, meet Mike. So <laughs> he's a self-made businessman with a small office that works with the customers. So several employees and few servers. Uh, Mike is a strong believer in all-in-one solutions. Uh, so he's looking for one networking device that will satisfy all his needs. Uh, Mike, Mike needs an access point for the office devices, guest network for the customers, five Ethernet ports for some PCs, internet and few servers. And Mike's friend Dave, from previous slide, uh, suggested to get HUB AC squared uh, because he examined the block diagram. He found nothing wrong with it. And uh, of course, uh, the guy jumped in and started to configure the device. And instantly what he did, he created his uh, virtual access point for guests. Uh, configured his own wireless AP, uh, and bridged all those things together. And then to restrict the guest network from the accessing his internal servers and devices, he applied the bridge filter. So, and in result, he has a problem because this configuration is wrong. He has a basically problem that the Servers uh, can't reach uh, one gigabit speed. There's high CPU load. Uh, internet, internet communications are slow. So with this simple configuration, what he did, he forced all traffic to travel through the bridge in a slow pathway. So all the traffic is going through the bridge filter. And uh, you can see that by looking in tools profile, you will see high bridging load. So to solve this, actually, we need to use some features from version 6.41. In 6.41, we backported uh, bridge, new bridge imp implementation from version 7 to version 6. So now bridging and switching happens exactly the same uh, way. So you just put the ports in the bridge, and if ports can use a hardware uh, path, so b basically switching, they will use that automatically. Uh, you can, of course, switch that off if you want. Uh, so basically, this, this bridge will automatically offload all the possible things that you can offload. And the nice thing about this is that, as I, as I told you, that there's an option on each bridge port, which is called HW, so hardware, uh, that you can enable yourself. And uh, if you enable it on the specific ports, uh, uh, so that those ports will skip all the CPU processing, which includes bridge filters. So by the way, uh, you can actually use this option as a filter before filter. So for example, in Mike's situation, he wants to filter out all the traffic that's coming from customers' virtual IP. Uh, and not let that traffic to the servers. But he wants all the other communication 
basically be switched. So he can enable this hardware option for all the other ports, all Ethernet ports that it has, and Bridge Fire will, will never see those, that traffic at all. So basically, you can yourself choose what traffic will go to the filter, bridge filter, before it actually gets there. There's no need to process all the traffic and making all the performance slow. So you can use this hardware offloading filter to separate what goes to this fil uh, firewall bridge filter and what doesn't. So this way you can separate the load and reduce the load on your device. So now internal devices work as expected, uh, perfectly, load is normal. Uh, but Mike notices that some of the customers are abusing the network privileges and applying heavy downloads both to Mike's servers and internal internet connection. So he wants to implement QoS and of course the typical solution that everyone does when they want to apply some queues on bridge network is to go to the interface bridge settings and set use IP firewall yes. And then set up some simple queues. Uh, so on AP interface, this virtual interface. And basically, again, slowing down uh, all the configuration. And of course, this is not the right solution in this case. So he actually have problems that queues doesn't s seems to work at all on all traffic, but on on only on some traffic and it causes additional load so if we take a look at the tools profile you will see uh, load in queues and firewall and uh, if you take a look at the packet flow diagram you will find out that simple queues when you specify target uh, will and the target is a bridge port will only only see bridge traffic with use IP firewall. It will not see the routed traffic because routed traffic uh, actually comes from the bridge interface itself, not the bridge port. So basically, the to create it with the simple queues, you need to create two queues, one for bridge traffic, another for routed traffic. But what if I tell you there's no need to use that use IP firewall at all? There's one queue that combines all the bridged traffic and all the routed traffic in the same place because it happens at very, very end of the packet flow diagram. And it's here, interface HTB. So if you p put a queue there on the interface itself, it will capture all the traffic that goes out through that interface. It doesn't matter if it was bridged before or it was routed before. So, because uh, in this diagram, routing traffic go like this and bridge traffic go through first box. So yeah, bridge goes through the first box and the uh, routing goes through the third box. So, but they all meet in the interface HTB. And, uh, Funny thing is that bridge filter and uh, mangle, firewall mangle, both have this packet mark option that you can use. And then just apply that packet mark to the Q3. So basically rendering that use IP firewall option un not needed and making this configuration much more faster. So that's the proper way how to combine both uh, transparent queuing and regular queuing for your customers if they if if that necessary so okay let's go into the next step so mike also got the wrong microtik id shirt uh, uh, for him so this logo like existed for a few days in the 1996 um, so now guests are limited uh, to the certain speed. Uh, Mike looks into what exactly customers are using his network for. Uh, so he looks at DNS cache and he finds out that looks like customers are browsing uh, his uh, competition web pages, uh, most likely to compare prices. 
and of course Mike doesn't want that. Also, he sees that uh, his employees are using internet too much at work for YouTube and Facebook, so he wants to restrict that also. So he looks into how to restrict those things. Of course, the first logical conclusion that he comes to is to use layer 7. He finds the first uh, most popular regex on the network, puts them on, and this configuration is wrong for many reasons <coughs> because there, it's a, there will be high CPU load, increased latency, packet loss, some jitter, and the funny thing is YouTube and Facebook will not be actually blocked. So you get all the, all the minuses without actual benefits. In tool profile, you will see high level uh, layer 7 load. So the reason for that is because this implementation that he implements here with the simple uh, drop rule uh, forces uh, connection tracking to recheck the same connection over and over and over again. And uh, other thing is that this layer, layer 7 filter is actually checked in the wrong place against the wrong traffic because if we examine this, this actually works only for DNS requests, not for actual YouTube traffic. So basically, this this uh, patterns will allow to block uh, only the DNS requests to the YouTube and Facebook. And the funny thing is that your phone applications will not actually use DNS. They connect directly to IPs, so you will not block them with these requests on there. So let's take a look what layer 7 actually is. So uh, la this layer 7 protocol is a method of searching of special patterns inside TCP, UDP, and ICMP streams. But in order to find a pattern, it needs to collect uh, some amount of data to look for that pattern. So in layer sep 7 case, it's 2 kilobytes or 10 packets. With the a rule that actually does drop instantly, you cannot get the, that amount of traffic. So because you already dropped it at the beginning, so there's no, this no collection part it doesn't exist there. So, and uh, basically all the patterns that you will be able to find on the internet are for those 10 kilobytes or, ten, oh sorry, two kilobytes or 10 packets. So the actual old way how to correctly implement this. So as you noticed uh, in this rule, I actually look at the UDP, uh, this DNS traffic only. And the first thing that I do, I check that this connection is not checked before or marked before by me. So I do not recheck it again again. So if it's already marked, it, I'm not interested in it. And what I do with this layer 7 rule, I only mark the connection. And then I can mark some packets from that connection, and then in the filter I can drop them. So that's the proper way how to use layer 7. The problem is, layer 7 for this implementation is already old. There's a better way, and it's called TLS host. So in version 6.41, new options were added. So as we all know, HTTP, simple HTTP is dying. So everyone's using HTTPS. So and it's much more harder to filter specific uh, web content. So uh, that's why we introduced this TLS uh, option, TLS host which will allow you to block HTTPS sites. So it's based on TLS SNE extension and uh, it, it basically uh, supports a glob style pattern and the correct implementation looks very simple. Like this, so you just uh, take a destination port 443 TCP and just for example for Facebook reject uh, all traffic that goes to the Facebook or YouTube. 
I use reject here because it will be much more easier to convince your browser that that site isn't available with the reject. If you just drop it, it will try and try and try and try again. But with the reject, it will understand, OK, it's not available. So it will generate less traffic in, in that case. So by this, I was trying to implement that you need to follow the latest features, because uh, the most demanding stuff uh, usually is implemented in the latest features. And there is always better solution than there was yesterday in the newest uh, router S features. Of course, you can do whatever you like. This is just a simple solution. You can classify it and so on. So yeah, mark connection and ma mark packets for that connection is the default thing that works, of course. So um, of course, uh, Mike keeps investigating all the Mikrotik features and the cor correct logo. So he already got to five-year-old logo on his T-shirt. So, uh, and he finds out that there's such thing as fast track that makes your router faster. So, okay, he try. So, what is the fast track? So. Uh, basically, that's a um, connection tracking um, flag uh, that allows uh, packets to maintain the fast pass. This only w works with the uh, version 4, TCP, and UDP. And the uh, downside of this fast pass thing is that this traffic will bypass almost all other facilities uh, of the router, like firewall and queues. So if you put a connection to the fast pass, it will fast pass through the router, leaving all these options behind. Uh, some of the packets will still go through the regular path, bec just because we need to refresh some connection tracking timeouts so those connection doesn't actually time out. But of course, the problem is, as soon as he enables faster connection with this rule that you see down there, his um, layer 7 and TLS host options stopped working. So, and then of course, every one of you start to think that of, of course, because it's bypassing everything, you can use either one or another. So, well, I'm here to say that it's actually not true. Uh, there's a smarter way to use this fast pass option. And for example, why do you need fast pass? Everything you can fa fast pass from 11 kilobyte, leaving first 10 kilobytes in slow pass. This will allow your layer 7 or TLS host to match or reject or do whatever you like. And then you can f fast pass everything else. So, combination of the fastest way, fast pass way, and the slow way the slowest feature way, it's possible. You just need to think about it. So FastPass is not binary flag just on and off. You can actually choose what traffic do you want to FastPass and what traffic do you need to slow pass to use some features that's necessary. So it's very common setup to have a queues and slow pass uh, the traffic that you are queuing and fast passing everything else. So it's not just a default configuration way of fast track that we add to our default configuration that fast tracks everything. So that's just a one way how to use it. So uh, Mike's business is booming. He opens a few more stores, deploys Microtech devices in them. Now he needs to interconnect offices with VPN securely. Uh, so, so the devices should be in the same subnet and with the high throughput. So of course, the security comes first. Uh, he creates an IPsec tunnel, but uh, problem is he using he's using masquerade on both ends, and that tunnel doesn't work. And the reason is very simple. Uh, uh, his NAT rules is changing his source address. 
uh, of encrypted packets, so source address doesn't correspond to the IPsec uh, policy uh, on the opposite end and is discarded as a result. So, uh, possible solution is to use one of the new features. It's relatively old, but still new, because it's largely unused. Is a new firewall table, it's called RAW, uh, that allows you selectively bypass or drop packets before connection tracking. So as you probably know, connection tracking is the most expensive resource demanding facility in a router OS. So for example, if somebody is DOS attacking you, uh, your load probably will be 99% from the connection tracking, trying to register each and every connection that's coming to you. So RAW is a table to protect your connection tracking from that kind of attack, uh, by and this way reducing the load on the CPU. So by skipping connection tracking with the things that you get, so first of all, fragments can pass through your router without being defragmented, because connection tracking requires all the fragments to be reassembled, and if you send them out via the same type of tunnel, they will be fragmented again. So sometimes you just need to send the fragments as they are to the next device so that end device only reassembles them. So you can skip that uh, using raw table. Uh, also, uh, if, there if you are skipping connection tracking, you are skipping all net, so it doesn't happen to that traffic. Uh, also, uh, fast track connection, mark connection, layer seven will not work. And all these, uh, all these packets that uh, bypass connection tracking will actually have connection state untracked so that you can you find, it, find them in the firewall. So as a solution, uh, you can add two rules uh, in your raw table that uh, basically does action no track for your IPsec traffic that the traffic that you have policy for. Uh, this will basically allow that traffic to skip NAT. This way you will not change source address and this will work. Uh, we are still arguing at the Microtik, do we need to add these rules automatically or add an option that add these rules automatically as soon as you create IPsec policy? But currently, uh, the you need to create your them your own yourselves. Uh, previously, before raw table, guys were actually doing accept rules in the NAT before the general masquerade. But this is much more faster way to do it. So of course, we forgot one thing. Uh, in Mike's setup, uh, he needs all devices be in the same network. So he needs to use Ethernet over IP. Of course, he jumps to the Microtik manual and finds out the old example that to securely bridge two local networks, you need to create L2TP tunnel and then run Ethernet over IP tunnel over it. But it's long time ago and it's wrong currently because web pages will open slowly, there will be slow download speeds, and actually strange suspicion that competition knows all your secrets. So you can diagnose all those things with a tool ping with different sizes, bandwidth test, you will find out that MTU of this connection is quite slow because of double overhead. So you create tunnel inside the tunnel, each tunnel adds an overhead. Also PPTP and L2TP are not considered secure anymore. So if somebody really wants, they can get into them quite easily. So the only nor probably the best way is to use IP security and to convert Ethernet over IP into secure link. We move to the, this very simple way. We put an IP secret option in almost every tunnel, just specify it, one name, and that's it on both ends and your IP Ethernet over IP tunnel will be securely uh, encrypted with IP security, and as we, in the first part with the Dave learned, uh, many 
new boards from Microtech comes with the IP security hardware encryption chip just for this reason so that you can properly secure all your VPNs so and to see that you of course you need to look into the tables performance tables of the devices to find out how much can you squeeze of encrypted traffic out of these devices so I hope I got you some uh, how you food for thought uh, so the next time you purchase a Microtech device you will know exactly what you want so are there any questions <coughs> okay if you have a question you will be able to find me yeah there was a question So the question was, the question was, when do you use drop rule other than reject? Probably uh, everything that's not uh, consistent with browsing, because uh, browsers usually try uh, are very aggressive of retrying stuff. So I would suggest basically use reject only on the uh, like. TCP traffic, mostly, and UDP on the drop on the UDP traffic. That will be probably the general rule that I would use. So, okay, and if you have any more questions, you will be able to find me there. So, thank you. <coughs>